Good to have everybody here this morning. We've got about a minute, I guess, before 10 o'clock. But we're glad to have you. Try to study the Bible a little bit today. A book 2,000 years old, you think, how in the world could that be relevant for 2013? It's more relevant than anything else you've read, whether it be from the news media, any author, or whatever, because it's the Word of God and it's alive. All right, Father, I pray for wisdom and I pray for the gift of teaching. Use this time wisely, glorify your holy name. Bless the folk who gathered together and give them ears to hear and a heart that's receptive to the Word of God. In thy name I pray, amen. If you turn the Bible to the book of Revelation, last chapter, and uh, chapter 22, and verse number, uh, verse number 18. Well, let's start with verse 16. Revelation 22. And verse number 16. Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So you'll notice, therefore, the testimony is to the church, because the church receives the revelation from God, not the world. The, the church is not instructed through some prophet that rises up in the world. The church is instructed through the Word, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, to instruct the world. The source of truth and the line of truth does not come from out there into here. It comes from in here out to there. So I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. God gets very serious about his Bible. Very serious about the Word of God. It's serious business. It's not a game. It's not a joke. It's not something subject to change. It's not, uh, it's not uh, written by the whim of people to apply to their culture and their generation, hoping that it may have an application sometime in the future. Uh, the bottom line is that men 2,000 years ago might not have had all the luxuries you have today and all the stuff we've got piled up around us, but they're the same people. Nothing's changed. Nothing. Technology doesn't change the human heart. So the Bible, therefore, changes not, and the Word of God changes not, God changes not, and our needs change not. They're the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Word of God, therefore, is fixed. It's something that is not flexible, and it's something that, that's not subject to reinterpretation and reapplication. Someone will come along and say, well, this generation, you know, they don't see it that way, so let's try to, let's try to relate to them and their world, and, and maybe we need to change a few things and blah, blah. No, sir, my friend. No, sir. No, sir. Their problems are the same as the problems of my generation. No difference. It's the Word of God. So therefore, when something changes in the Word of God, something in the Word changes from one dispensation to the next or what have you, that's a big deal. That's a very important thing. And as I've been teaching now for weeks, I try to get across the idea, I am a dispensationalist. I have to, I will, don't have to, I will confess to that. I didn't arrive at that conclusion overnight by studying the Bible. I found that there are things in Scripture that just simply don't fit in other words, one, one, one application does not necessarily fit in every age because things change. Uh, and so therefore, the Word of God, the Bible, has something to say about that. And it will apply, make an application during that period of time. Uh, for example, when we change from law to grace, we're changing from the dispensation of law 
over to the dispensation of grace. And why did we change? We changed because they rejected the king and the kingdom. They rejected the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, a change was necessary. And that change was from the dispensation of the law into grace. We changed from the dispensation of human government into law. We, dis we changed from when, before the flood and after the flood. Before the flood, we had the, before, when man was first put here, was in a state of innocency. And then once the knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of sin came, uh, he was taken from a state of innocency into a state of, uh, of, uh, of wisdom or understanding and knowledge. So therefore, he's judged according to that. Things he didn't know, he wasn't judged for. But now he knows, so he tries to cover his sin. God deals with him thusly on that ground. And then after the flood, it goes into the, what we call human government. Human government where men govern themselves. What happened? They built a tower to Babel. So God calls a man from Ur of the Chaldees, reveals himself to him, and that man becomes the head of all those who believe. Then he raises up Moses and gives you what's called the law. He never gave it to the Gentiles. He gave it to the Jews. The law ran its course. The law could never save anyone. The law could never justify anyone. The law could never give them a clear conscience. And so therefore, when Christ came, he had a forerunner come before him whose name was John the Baptist. And the Bible says the law and the prophets were until John. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And I've talked about that yet last Sunday about the pressing and the violent ticket by force. We talked about that. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, when he established his ministry on this earth, it was to the Jew. He gave them the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven because they are both running concurrently at the same time because we have one man now who's qualified to be head over both, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But they rejected both. And so when they rejected it, God put Israel in a state of blindness and he raised up the apostle Paul who became the apostle to the Gentiles. And he became the one who laid the foundation of the church of God, which is the grace of God. The Jew will once again rise to preeminence. And we'll talk about that here this morning when we get into all of this. The Bible makes two statements that uh, in Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 25. Turn there with me this morning. Romans 11, 25. And then uh, get uh, Luke 21, 24 on the other hand. Romans 11, 25, and then Luke 24, 21 rather, verse 24. <coughs> Luke 21, 24, and then uh, Romans 11, 25. All right, now Romans 11, 25, it says, For I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, and that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. All right, now let's stop. We won't read any further. Just hold your place and go back to Luke 21 and verse number 24. And they, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right, we have two distinct statements here. One's called the fullness of the Gentiles and the other one's called the times of the Gentiles. And there are those who think they're the same. I do not believe that. I believe there's a difference in them. You study them in context. And you'll see that it's talking about two entirely different things, events going on as it relates to something. But one talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, the other the times of the Gentiles. Now, if you go back to 606 B.C. in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, you'll know that he saw an image in the plains of Dura that had a head of gold, a chest of silver, midsection of brass, legs of iron that continue on down into feet of iron and clay. So in other words, it starts with gold the highest and the best, and winds up with dirt, clay, and iron. And both come from, uh, both of them come in, a, come in a mystical, mysterious form because iron and clay does not mix. It's impossible to mix them. They just do not mix. But it is an image that Daniel begins to interpret in chapter number, chapter number 2 and chapter number 7, chapter number 10, chapter number 11, and that image represents the successive progression of Gentile kingdoms. Babylon, 
Medo-Persia, Grecia, and Rome. And Rome goes into a split, 1054 AD, the Roman Empire was split, it's called the Great Schism. If you type that into the internet and, and do, a, do, a, do, a, do, a, do a Google search on it, just type in the Great Schism, that's good enough, and it'll pull it up, 1054 AD. And they broke, uh, they separated. Constantinople, which was in the east, was the eastern branch of the uh, Catholic Church. And let me once again define the word Catholic. It simply means universal. The Catholic Church. It has meant a lot of things to a lot of people for 2,000 years. A lot of different people have used the term Catholic. Today the term Catholic is used by a lot of different groups uh, that, that make up the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church. The whole the point is if they will acknowledge the primacy of the Pope of Rome, that's the point. If you will acknowledge the primacy of the Pope of Rome and the magisterium as it is taught from the Pope, then uh, you can be considered uh, part of the communion. That's what they, the way they say it. Now in 1054 A.D. when the church split, the western branch was located in Rome, the eastern branch in Constantinople, which was first Byzantium, then called Constantinople after Constantine the emperor, and today it is called Istanbul. It's called Istanbul because of the Ottoman Turks who overran the place and, uh, and changed the church of Hagia Sophia. They changed it into a Muslim mosque. They love doing that. Uh, right now they are murdering Christians in Pakistan. They're murdering Christians in Syria. They're murdering Christians in, Ethi in, in, uh, in, in Egypt. They're murdering Christians in, in Sub-Sahara, in the Sudan, in, in Africa. They're murdering Christians everywhere they are, they are advancing. Americans don't understand yet. They haven't yet waken up to the fact that the Muslim, the Muslims are now on a front and they are doing everything they can to drive every remnant of Christianity out of the Middle East, of Africa, for example, Syria right now. Syria, folks, is, is probably the oldest, oldest seat of New Testament Christianity that you'll find on the face of this earth, Syria. They have churches over there that are 15, 16, 1700 years old. They just burned a church to the ground in Egypt that had been standing since 400 A.D. These Muslims don't care. They'll murder you. They have, a, they have a Christian pastor right now detained in Iran. And this man is, is being detained by the Iranian government. And I don't know what his charges are. They're nothing. You can be sure, certain of that. Uh, you know, proselyting or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a capital offense in, in Muslim countries to try to win somebody to the Lord if they even let you live. But it's going on everywhere right now, especially in Syria. These people over there that are called moderate Muslims in Syria, moderate Muslims, moderate Muslims. We're talking about not, we're talking about homegrown Syrian uh, Muslims. They're moderate Muslims. We're not talking about Al-Qaeda that's come in and all the rest of them. They are already saying they want an Islamist state. The moderate Muslim does in Syria. What does that mean? That means that they are going to kill all the Christians that are in Syria. So Constantinople was the eastern branch, uh, and at that time it was, uh, it was uh, Byzantium, then changed to Constantinople, and Rome was the western branch. And so the, the progression of history winds up there with the split of the Catholic Church. Now, that times of the Gentiles run from 606 B.C., and some say, well, they run up to the Treaty, uh, the Declaration of Balfour, 1917, or they run up to May the 4th, 1948, when Israel became a nation. But I want you to notice something in Scripture that uh, speaks directly to the times of the Gentiles. Look at the book of Zechariah, chapter number 8, and verse number 22. Zechariah 8, 22. Go to 1416. No, I've got the wrong references. 
Let's see. Here it is. Uh, here it is. Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 2. Revelation 11, 2. Revelation 11, 2. Now look carefully at this. Revelation 11, 2. The court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. See that? All right. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. All right. Now when does this take place? Absolutely. It's a future thing, tribulation. And the scripture is very clear that the Gentiles are going to trod under their feet the holy city, Jerusalem. And the Bible says that Jerusalem, Luke chapter number 21, verse 24, Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. What does that mean? That means that the times of the Gentiles are still roaring away. Now, this is the standard interpretation. You see, since the day that Nebuchadnezzar's army conquered Jerusalem, 586 B.C., the city of the great king has been trodden down or under the control of a foreign government. Babylon, then the Medes and Persians, followed by Greece, then Rome, and after that the Arabs and Turks for 1,500 years till the 19th century when Britain came to control Jerusalem. 1948, Britain withdrew from Palestine. The Jews won their independence. Noticeably, they still did not control Jerusalem. The city remained under Jordanian rule until the Six-Day War, 1967. It was on that June day when General Moshe Dayan, his army marched into the old city, took it back to Jewish control. That day, the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. Jerusalem was no longer ruled by a foreign country. After over 2,500 years, the Jews finally reclaimed their holy city. All the things he said are true, but the interpretation's incorrect. Amen. Now, you've got to watch that. The facts are facts. They're true. They did take the old city back. They took it back from Jordan. Jordan got into a war they shouldn't have gotten into, and it cost them dearly. They took the city back. But the truth of the matter is, the Gentiles, according to the book of Revelation, it's very clear, they're going to trod underfoot Jerusalem. They're going to come in there for three and a half years, which will be the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. They're headed toward Jerusalem. Uh, I, I hope you understand that the focus of everything in the last days will be toward the Holy Land. It'll be toward Jerusalem. And that's where it's headed. Now, who these Gentiles are, we know that Ezekiel talks about Gog and Magog coming down from the north. Now, here's a little thing you need to understand about what's going on with communism. Communism, as far as Russia is concerned, is finished. The, uh, there may be, there probably are. There's people in, there are people in Russia who love Stalin. <laughs> they want Stalin back. But uh, for, the, for the most part, Russia has produced some of the wealthiest people in the world. You wouldn't believe how many billionaires have come out of Russia. Why? Well, for, for number one, Russia is, is, when it comes to oil wealth and natural gas, is right at the top of the list. And Russia, the Russian people are hard-working people. But here's the kicker. The Russian Orthodox Church is being supported directly by Vladimir Putin. He is supporting the Russian Orthodox Church. His mother baptized him, had him baptized when he was an infant. His father was a communist, an atheistic communist. But Putin was baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, whether Vladimir Putin in his heart and in his soul is a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's between him and his God. But the fact of the matter is, he is making statements now about sodomy and about the debauchery in America and about, uh, and about the West and the kind of life that the people are living in the West, that if you didn't know anything about the history of Russia and the history of America and just looked at it on the surface of what's going on today, you'd say to yourself, my goodness gracious, here we live in a nation where they'll throw you in jail for hate speech if you're not careful. And they are promoting sodomy. And Russia is hosting the Olympics in 2014, and, the, and they're under pressure now that they say, well, if you don't do something about these statements you're making and the laws you've passed in Russia about sodomy, we're not going to come. And so Vladimir Putin sends back to them and says, if you come and hold hands, we'll throw you in jail. 
Now you see, how long has it been since you've heard anybody talk like that? Take a clear, distinct statement and take a stand on it and not yield to political correctness. And that's exactly what he said. It's illegal in Russia to, to publicly display sodomy in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in, in front of young children, especially. They say that's what it's about. Now, the, po <clears throat> the point is, who is Russia and what's going on with Russia? Is Russia the force to be contended with? You have to contend with Russia as it relates to Israel. For, for decades, you've heard it said time and time and time and time again that Meshach is Moscow, Gog and Magog is the land of Russia. And so therefore, Russia becomes the sworn enemy of Israel. So what's going to have to happen with this thing is that here we are in the last days. Uh, sometimes Bible interpretation just doesn't work out the way people have interpreted it. God's not bound to our mistakes. <laughs> If I make an error, the Lord's not going to say, well, I love him, and I'm going to have to go in there and square the, you know, I'm going to have to stick with my man. No, he sticks with his word, <laughs> not his man. So what does that mean, preacher? That means that we better get on our face and our knees and make sure our interpretation is correct. I'm not here to defend Russia, and I certainly no, will not defend communism. But friend of mine, make no mistake about it. Write this down in your book. I will not defend, I will not defend sodomy, and I will not defend abortion. And I will not defend the direction this country's headed. Amen. This country's headed away from God. Amen. Amen. My allegiance is to the Bible, to the Lord God Almighty, to His Word, the Holy Ghost, and the truth. Amen. Yes, sir. You mean the enemies are, are armed from Russia? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. They have modern weapons that are talking. They have modern weapons now. They're talking about missiles that, uh, that they're just talking about that can sink aircraft carriers. And uh, I know what happened down there in the war with uh, with uh, Argentina, when uh, Margaret Thatcher sent those sent those ships down from Great Britain, back about what 20 years ago. Uh, they sailed. It took them something like eight or ten days to get down there. They were they were arguing over the Malvinas. Uh, the Israel calls them the Falklands. The, the Argentina calls them the Malvinas. Not Israel, but the Great Britain. They call them the Falklands. And uh, they sent their ships down there. This was a modern, a modern British destroyer. One, a modern British destroyer was in a bay down there. One Argentine uh, a, a fighter turned loose with one missile and sent that thing to the bottom. Just like that. And it was the finest that Great Britain had. You talk about shock waves all over the world. The biggest shockwave was, where did they get that kind of missile? They had no idea the kind of power they were going against. So what I'm saying to you is that the United States may be going against power that they're not aware of. They may possibly be going against power they're not aware of. Listen, folks, if an aircraft <coughs> carrier goes to the bottom, it takes 5,000-plus souls with it. That's a lot of people. Ask yourself this question this morning. Ask yourself this question this morning. Which side would God be on? Is God going to wake up America? Is he going to send something to this nation that is headed headlong into hell? They act like they can do anything they please with impunity. This is a wicked nation. It's wicked. By the time your children are five to ten years old, if they've drawn, grown up in American culture, if you don't do something to change it, they are godless, atheists, they are anti-Christ, right. anti-everything you believe in. Right. Right. I didn't mean to get to preaching, but I'm telling you the truth, that's the truth. It really is. It galls me. It galls me. It galls me for people to take the position, oh, God's behind America and he'll support America in anything we do. You better back off and think twice about it. You better back off and think twice about it. There's a lot of people who believe that the New York sitting up there on the Hudson River, New York, if you look at a, if you look at a, a map of New York City, you can superimpose it over a map of ancient Babylon, and boy, I'll t they match up. That is quite a coincidence, isn't it? Yeah, so we go. So the times of the Gentiles, when do, when do the times of the Gentiles cease? 
The times of the Gentiles will end when it says plainly in the book of Daniel, that stone cut out of a mountain smites it on its feet. So when is that? When does that happen? Second advent. So the times of the Gentiles not bound to May 14th, 1948, or the Balfour Declaration, 1917. According to the book of, Daniel, book of Revelation, chapter number 11, plainly the times of the Gentiles is, is, is in vogue. It's going on headstrong in the middle of the tribulation and doesn't end until the second advent, until the Lord God comes back in power and glory. That's when he puts an end to the Gentile reign. Now, you remember last week I told you how that the Gentiles, the Gentiles as a national body, this is important to understand this, in the book of Revelation, the word Gentiles, the word nations, shows up 19 times. Nations, 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 nations. Now, if it shows up 19 times in a book like that, you have to step back and say, then the Lord's trying to draw our attention to a national thing here, and he is. He's looking at nations. You know what he said in the Old Testament about the nations? He said they're but a drop in a what? Bucket. All the nations of the world. America is a baby, 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 baby nation. We're young. We're, st we're still in diapers. <laughs> we haven't been around any time. When I'm talking about Syria, I'm talking about these churches over there in Syria. Syria goes all the way back to Laban. <laughs> 1900 B.C. Laban is called the Syrian. Rebecca came from Syria when she came into the house, into the house of uh, Abraham and became the wife of Isaac. She came from Syria. Syria is an ancient nation. They've been around forever. America's only been here a few hundred years. So we're babies, you know, when it comes to that. And the truth of the matter is, you're looking at ancient cultures that have developed over millennium. America is a mixing pot, a blending pot, a melting pot that is still in its experimental stages. And America has changed drastically in the last 50 years. Drastically. This nation is no, doesn't bear any resemblance to what it did 50 years ago. So it was founded on a wonderful constitution, which means nothing to most of the crowd up there in D.C. But that constitution, as far as a man-made document is concerned, is a wonderful thing. The Bill of Rights is wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, how long will a nation like this endure when it throws away all of its moorings, all of its foundation, all of its beginnings? God has blessed America, but will he continue to bless America? That's the big question, and that's what you need to ask yourself. So will America become part of the Gentile kingdoms that show up in those two legs that are smitten when the image is smitten on its feet? If it does, folks, if, it, if, if America is part of that end time Gentile nations of the book of Revelation, then it will be no more. It will be no more. It will not go into the millennium. America will suffer annihilation. It will be destroyed at the second advent of the Son of God because America, along with the other Gentile nations, will be coming against Israel to fight the battle of Armageddon. So deceived by the Antichrist, Revelation 13, they'll think they're fighting for God. But it'll be a God of their own imagination and creation. So the times of the Gentiles end at the second advent. Now what's the fullness of the Gentiles then? What would that be? Yes, sir. The fullness of the Amorites not yet, not yet come. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. When the Lord sent those three angels, and he was one of them, that showed up there at Sodom and Gomorrah, he said their cry has arisen to heaven. Yeah. Has arisen to heaven. He said, I've heard them. And what was their cry? Their cry was the godless wickedness that they had fallen into. That's how, how deep they had descended into debauchery. And uh, yes, sir. I know, I might be preaching on that tonight. If you know and you don't know, there's a vast, 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 vast difference between the two. 
if you don't know and you don't know. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think you're getting close to it because the fullness of the Gentiles means that they filled up something. They filled up something. And uh, yes, sir. Okay, tell me what you think, brother. In, Roman, or in Romans 11, 25, it says, uh, after the fullness of the Gentiles come in, so shall all Israel be saved. Oh, okay, well, we go back to the text. Now, here we go. When the time of the, the, uh -huh. when the fullness comes in. Uh, That's why I didn't read the next verse. <laughs> when is Israel saved? Okay. A nation should be born in a day. A nation should be born in a day. In Zechariah chapter number 12, the national uh, salvation of Israel takes place at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they shall look upon me who they have pierced. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, then shall a fountain be opened in Jerusalem for sin. Uh, Go back to Romans 11. He's talking about now. You remember when we read it, I told you to stop and not read the next verse. Okay, because the next verse places it in context. <coughs> Romans 11. Verse number 24, but 25 rather. For I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, now, it's talking about Israel as a collective body now, not individuals, but as a body with an identity, in other words. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, watch verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. All right, now let's stop right there. When will all Israel be saved? What does it say? What's the next verse? What's the remainder of that one verse right there? That's right. And turn, on, and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. All right. So when does the second advent take place? At the end. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. All right. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, he says in Zechariah, and mourn for him as one that mourneth for his own soul. All right. As one that mourneth for his firstborn. That's what he says in Zechariah. All right. So when the Lord Jesus comes back visibly, physically to this earth and appears to Israel, that's when they're going to get saved. Now, he's going to make an appearance to them sometime during the tribulation period. And what kind of an appearance that's going to be, I don't know. But when he comes, that's where Matthew 24 fits in, where you've got five wise and five foolish virgins. And one of them says, my Lord, the five wise prepared themselves, but the five foolish says, My Lord delayeth his coming, because they're the ones associated with the ones who knew he's coming. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. They had been prepared and waiting, yet they turned away. They, they, they turned away from that coming. Israel will bring, God will bring Israel out to meet him. And he will plead with them, he says in the book of Jeremiah. He will cause them to pass under the rod. He will measure them. He will purge out the rebels. And he will prepare them to be the head of all the nations. Because it's still a national thing. The salvation at the end of the tribulation period. He said, you'll not be the tail, but you'll be the head. In the book of Revelation, it's nations, 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 nations. Now when the Lord comes back, he elevates Israel to the head of all the nations again. Yes, sir. Jerusalem, which is the last 
that number, that 144,000, is this going to be those that are drawn from the 12 tribes that are withdrawn like into, in and about Jerusalem at the very point when, just like we saw in the western years, years ago, where that uh, little group of settlers or uh, pilgrims were being surrounded and annihilated and eventually then the cavalry came over the hill. Is this going to be the apex of court where the 144,000 are centered at? in and about from the nation of Israel from the 12 tribes throughout Jerusalem that the Lord himself is going to come back and, and that Well here's the purpose of the 144,000 church is gone there's no longer preachers in the pulpit preaching the word of God the age of grace has, 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 has consummated and all the focus now is back to the Jew in the book of Zechariah it says plainly that he turns from the Gentiles and he turns back to the Jew all right, and when he turns back to the Jew, he's preparing to elevate them to the head of all the nations. Therefore, they become the evangelist. Seven men will take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we heard God is with you. And they are the believing remnant. They certainly are. Of course, he'll always have a remnant in every generation. But in Revelation chapter number 7, then again in chapter number 14, you see these 144,000 pointed, uh, 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 pointed out, picked out. And God is focusing your attention on them. And they are the ones who did not defile themselves. They were not touched. They were not perverted. In other words, they become the very source of the truth in the tribulation period. Who's going to preach? Because you have them and you have the false Christ and the false prophet. See, in Revelation 13. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, probably. <laughs> and, and remember, you know, people forget, you know, when it says all, all the nation will be saved, but there's two thirds of it are going to be destroyed, and only one third will uh, go into the millennial kingdom. So it's going to be a very bloody time. Yeah, it will, except those days will be shortened. And, you know, but, when you look at it, Egypt, doesn't it do the same thing? I mean, yeah, God reveals himself to the Jews, brings them out. Yeah, it's a type. It certainly is. It is. But, but uh, right now, right now, in 2013, uh, September the 29th, 2013, do you see any revivals in the churches? In America, there may be some sporadic local places here and there, but as far as the country is concerned, it's a joke. Now, I've read about revivals in China. I've, I've read about in places in uh, Africa and here and there where there's some real power of God moving. But for the most part, the focus of, of, uh, of, uh, of the power of God is back to the Jew. These Jews, folks, in these, uh, uh, these young men studying are uh, full of zeal. They go to these, uh, these Jewish, uh, I forget now, I can't think of the name of it, where they, their schools. And I mean, they spend hour after hour after hour after hour studying the Torah, and they are on fire for God. The Jewish people are not dying. They're coming alive. And their faith is coming alive. The faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Christian church has turned into, a, into an abominable whore when it comes to the church, when it comes to the truth. And this is what the Bible calls her in Revelation chapter number 17, calls her a whore. People make a great mistake by thinking that that whore in Revelation 17 is just the Roman Catholic Church. You're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. It's made up of apostate so-called Christianity, which includes them, no question, but it includes all the rest of them too. Yes, sir. Yeah. And her mom is pulling her so she's living with wolves. I mean, yeah. Her grandson is already gone that way. Her spirit is being vexed. Yeah, and uh, she speaks up, and she, she's, you know, calming it down. Not really calming it, but I mean, but she's put down for it. And Even as young as she is, she can discern the difference. Yeah, she's forced to go there. She was forced to go there this morning. I mean, and she, she hates it. She stays in the car. She screams. And I can't tolerate it. You've got to 
Isn't that amazing? You hear what he's saying about his granddaughter? That's awful. <coughs> well, they can't stop you from seeing your grandchildren. If you want to go to a court of law, you can stop that business. They, yes, sir. You have rights as a grandparent. Oh, yeah, they cannot cut you off from your grandchildren unless they have some, you're, you know, you're, you're mentally unstable or some reason why otherwise. No, no, sir, Reed, they can't cut you off. Do you know who the kids go to? You know who the, when the, if something happens and a family breaks up and the daddy has been thrown in prison and mama's over here uh, in a drug rehabilitation, do you know what happens to You know the first people they turn to for the children? The grandparents. They certainly do. Do you know why? Because you're the closest to those children. Yeah. No, I wouldn't either. Sometimes the Almighty. That's ridiculous. I mean, how old is she? She's 10 years old. She's been coming to church for, for you, you said seven years. For seven years. And see, she was coming here then in her formative years. The first, five, first four or five years of life are so very, very important. And she was, uh, she was coming here and, and, and around this spirit. This is not a rock and roll church. No, it's not a rock and roll church. It's not a rock and roll church. I don't have anything to do with rock and roll religion, and I don't have anything to do with rock and roll God. I know. It's all the flesh. It's all the flesh. It's all the flesh. And that church is here in Knoxville? Uh, Powell. In, in Powell? Yeah. They're all over now. Oh, yeah. Oh, they yeah. It's okay to fornicate and shack up? Our daughter's doing that now. Everybody I talk to that goes to church, they're never married. None of them are married there. I mean, they yeah, but they've got them in church. They see these preachers talk about they're unchurched. So, we, you know, just keep living the way you are, but we're going to get you in church. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's as men, empty, meaningless junk as it can be. Yes, ma'am. The Torah is, Matthew, is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Well, they have this huge scroll. It's huge, like this big around and about like table length. And they have men, and they're fully adorned in like their priestly robes and whatnot. Well, you're talking about Jews. Yes. And they, uh, whatever they practice during this time of year or whatever season this is for them. Um, this is tabernacles. When they read it, it's, it's not like the Bible, you know, where we go page to page. It's this huge roll, and as they roll it out, he has this scepter-like instrument that he takes it, and, and it's all written in Hebrew. Yeah. You can see the words clearly are not English words. Yeah. And He's they, reading it from right to left yes, then. Yes, and he has one gentleman on one side that's rolling it up while he's reading it, and then you've got two over here that's handling because it's so huge. Um, but the thing that I really loved about it was the man who was reading had black-bound holy Bible in his right hand while he was taking his left hand reading the Torah. And then whatever else takes place in this tradition or celebration, um, they come marching down the aisle and each one of the priests is holding like a, a holy object or like a, a, a piece of their past. And you can just tell by their countenance and the look on their face that the certain level of pride. Um, she's teaching her daughter all of these things, but when she and I talk, she talks of the same Jesus we believe in. She talks of the same, what's the word, doctrine that we talk about. She believes in the second coming. She says she is born again. You know, 
No, she's not the... Well, then she's a Messianic Jew. Yes. Just wonderful to be around her. I mean, knowledgeable, knowledgeable right. person. But to see those pictures and to see her training her children, and like you said, they are keeping those, and they are becoming more and more. It's just, it's amazing. I'm just, I count myself privileged to be around her. Yeah. I really yeah. do. And I go along with them a long way. Uh, but in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You have to understand that. They don't have a privileged position with God. It's one body. One body. Make of twain one new man. One new man. Yes, sir. Well, we'll pick it up again next week. Brother, I, I, That's all right, brother. I don't worry about it. Well, don't let the devil beat you to death because I like for people to participate. And, and participate, if, if people participate, it shows me you're listening, you know, and you want to know what's going on. I know it. Well, do, that's okay, brother. This book right here is The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. Okay, I've had this book. I usually put the date when I buy it. 88, I bought this book. This has the 70th week of Daniel in it. Daniel 70 weeks of prophecy. And this man goes into detail, a, a lot of detail, and shows you how that every bit of the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled to the, to, the, to the most exact detail, except for the 70th week, which is the tribulation. tribulation. I would recommend Sir Robert Anderson's book right here. Amen. It's a masterpiece. Yes. And about anything that Sir Robert Anderson writes, he is genuinely Sherlock Holmes. Yes. This man was, a, was an inspector with Scotland Yard. He took that kind of meticulous research into this and you can benefit greatly from it. I'm sure you can still get it. I mean, surely they haven't taken it off the bookshelves. You can get it online, if nothing else. But I would highly recommend The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll pick that up next week. We'll get on all this stuff next week. All right, Brother Chafin, dismiss us, please.